everybody. It's so good to see everyone, everyone watching also online. We have several hundred people watch at least every week online live, and so it's so good to see you. Can we welcome everyone that's watching online? It's so glad that you can watch with us and be part of this today. Uh, and just to let you know, we are continuing with a series called Living a Life of Ten, and basically it is that God is basically wants us to live a life of ten, which means he wants the best for us. Now, I, I'm not talking about the best we think but God's best for us. He designed us. He loves us. He knows what's best for us. And the Ten Commandments are not some big prohibition that God has put out there waiting for us to screw up. And we, did, we asked a survey of people. I asked them on social media uh, what they thought when I said Ten Commandments. They're like, I can never measure up. I'm never good enough. I'll never be able to do what I'm supposed to do. And I, I just I, forget about it. That's not the kind of attitude that God would have for us. The Ten Commandments are really ten opportunities for us to align our life in a way that's great. And, and that this is a, these are universal laws that go beyond ceremonial law or civil law. This is moral law, the Ten Commandments. And so some of the things we're going to share today are going to talk about that and how this can make our life better. God really wants your life to be a, a life of ten. He really wants you to be the utmost of what he's created you to be. For those of you that are parents or you have any nieces or nephews or friends, come on, you want your children to survive, right? You want your children to thrive. And God wants the same for us. Today, uh, we're going to the fourth commandment today, which is this, arresting death by God's rest. Arresting death by God's rest. What, what's that all about? Well, the fourth commandment is taking uh, remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy. But very interesting, a lot of people don't listen to this one. Uh, the church in general, sometimes we're good with the other uh, eight or nine of them, but that one fourth one, that eh, doesn't really make a difference. God, God understands, I got to work. And we find ourselves being stressed out, ourselves being so stretched, so thin, and we wonder why there's so, uh, there's so much anxiety and stress. We're going to get into it in a few moments, but arresting death by God's rest. During the French Revolution, what happened was a guy named by the name of Voltaire decided to ban Christianity. And what he did, and one of the ways he did it was by saying this, we cannot destroy Christianity until we first destroy the Sabbath, the day of rest. And so what they did is they, they changed it. Instead of having a day of rest every seven days, he made it every ten days. And you know what the devastation was upon that society? People got sick. Animals died. It was chaos where they had to change it back to one, uh, one day out of seven. Now, what's so amazing about that, it's actually stitched into our DNA. It's stitched into our design. And, and so we're going to be talking about that today. But many people, they work themselves to death. They work themselves to death. In fact, God would say, arresting death by God's rest. God wants to give us rest to get rid of that death feeling. You see, uh, and a number of years ago, in 2013, a, a famous journalist in Japan by the name of Mira Sado actually worked 159 extra hours, and she died by working herself to death. 31 years old. It was a national story. It actually became an international story. And, and what happened is their parents had a press conference. Her parents are sitting there talking about how the work culture in Japan and the demands were so horrific that it drove the culture of death, of working, 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 to her, their daughter died. And I believe today, in many ways, God would be sitting at this table with, and looking at us and asking you, why are you killing yourself by working so hard? I haven't designed you to work 24-7. I haven't designed you to carry that load. And many people are working themselves to death and don't even realize it, prematurely dying. All kinds of psychological and physical ailments as a result of never stopping work. We're not created to work all the time, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So the Ten Commandments, just to kind of review, the Ten Commandments weren't given as a requirement for salvation, everybody, okay? But rather as a response to salvation. The Ten Commandments are God's love potion, if you will, to help us to experience life. In fact, also the Ten Commandments are born out of love 
and not law. Just to remind us every single week, because so many people think it's all about these 10, you better do these 10 or else. No, it's really a recipe for experiencing God's 10 in your life. You see, in Exodus chapter 20, it says this. This is the Ten Commandments found two places. Exodus 20 and also Deuteronomy 5. And this is what God would tell, said through Moses, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, a Sabbath, a rest to your Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock. God even cares about animals. Or the sojourners who live within your gates. For in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. How many of you like to have a blessed day? Right? How many of you like to get paid uh, triple time uh, on your day off? Would you like that? Yeah, well, God wants to bless us. He made the Sabbath a holy day. And he made it holy. And what's so interesting is this. What does it mean to have a Sabbath day? What does it mean? Do we, that's Old Testament, right? So we don't have a Sabbath today, which means this, this, you know, the, the seventh day. So what's the story with the Sabbath? How does it work for us today? Well, we're going to look into it in a few moments. But what does it mean to keep and observe the Sabbath? Well, first of all, Sabbath means to cease or to stop. Ever feel that way? Why don't you stop for a moment? Can I just stop this for a moment? It just goes on and on. You ever feel that way that you have about five hamsters running in your mind? It's like it's always on the go. Have you noticed that? That there's always something going on. There's social media. There's the news. There's always demands upon us. And if you're not careful, you're constantly under tension and never able to relax. And so what it basically means, Sabbath actually means to cease or to stop. And God wants us to stop and rest. Now, what I find so interesting is, why is it that Christians think, you know what, the other ten I'm okay, not murdering all that, no adultery, but the Sabbath, I, I need to work. I got a lot to do. We tend to blow this one off to our duress. And, and by the way, it's not like God's angry at us for doing this. It actually hurts our design. So if someone hurts your design, do you get frustrated? Of course. You're abusing God's created order. You're abusing yourself. See, so why was the commandment given in the first place? Well, it is in our created design before the fall. Before sin entered the planet, do you realize that God rested on the seventh day? There was no sin. God created work. Work's a good thing. And rest is a good thing. So this is something in God's design prior to sin messing everything up. So, track with me for a second. If rest was necessary when things were perfect, how much more important is rest when things are imperfect? Think about that. So this is something before the law. This is something before sin entered on our planet. You see, it says in the scripture in Genesis 2, verse 2 through 3, in the book of Genesis, it says the following. This is how it all began. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because God rested. Why would God have to rest? Do you know what the word rest actually means? Take a breath. How did God create? The Bible said he spoke. Let there be. He breathed on mankind and brought life. So what did God do on the, on the Sabbath? He took his breath. Ever heard anyone say, hey, let me catch my breath here. Hold on, hold it, hold it. God did this as an example. Does God really need to take a breath? Does God really need to rest? Probably not. But he's setting an example for us to follow. Because he, a, a good, le good leadership leads by example, right? And the ultimate leader of them all is God. And so God leads by example. Just like Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, he didn't have to be baptized. It was a foreshadowing what was going to happen as an example for us. So God blessed the seventh day, and God rested from all of his work that he'd done in creation. So it's in our created design. I hope you understand that. This is beyond the law. 
This is not the Old Covenant. This is not Old Testament. This is not legalism. It's called your design, your actual design. Okay? Also, it gives God the opportunity to provide for us supernaturally. It gives God the opportunity to do that. You see, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest. Let me give you a little context here. The Israelites were in the wilderness, in the desert at this time, and God provided them something called manna. Manna was this supernatural food that God gave them every day, and they were to collect it six days, but on the seventh day, they were not supposed to collect it. Okay? Before we do that for a moment, let me just ask you all a question. How many of you grew up when Sunday was a day of rest? I mean, only one. Back in the 1870s and the 1880s, when I, was, when I was living back in those days, I remember growing up in the 1970s, all right, and on Sunday, the roads were empty. I mean, it was like Old Country Road and uh, Mineola, Long Island, New York, Long Island, no, not Long Island, it's Long Island, okay, it was empty. And what we would do, my mother would put a pot roast in, every, we had roast beef, almost, I love roast beef, okay. We had roast beef, mashed potatoes, and what would happen, we'd go to church, my mother would make it the day before, put it in the oven, come back, and then my grandparents would be there, everyone would be there, and we'd have a huge meal. And, and everyone was there, it was fantastic. We all had a good time together. And we'd eat and eat and eat and talk and laugh, and then we'd take a nap. There's nothing like a Sunday afternoon roast beef. If you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry. You have a tofu roast or something. But anyhow, so that's what we used to do, right? And everything was closed. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, in the mid-70s, late-70s, they started changing that. They called it the Blue Laws, and they started opening stores. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, there's been some studies, and I don't have the studies here in front of me, but they've done some studies about psychological um, stress levels in our culture and how it cor correlates with the amount of work we do as a culture and how things that mental health has gone down significantly since we stopped having a rest. That just never ends. We have this thing going on. All Remember the days when you could go leave the house without your phone? Remember that? It's like, I didn't have a phone. I, I wasn't having an anxiety attack. I didn't have my phone. You remember that? You said drive, and if you want to make a phone call, you had to pull up the side of the road and find this thing, like, like called a booth, where Superman used to change his clothes, right? You go in there, you put a dime in, and you'd have to make a phone call. I remember I thought it was cool to have a page. You remember those days? I mean, think about it. We didn't have these phones all the time. And you could actually get away from it all. Now, constantly, you have this thing buzzing in your pocket. Right? Telling you what's going on. Instagram, uh, Snapchat, Facebook for the old people. <laughs> and all, it's always going on. There's always something, right? There's always th something going on. Someone gives you a work-related email or something takes place. You cannot shut it off. It's like the hamsters in your mind continue to run on the wheels. Like, I can't stop thinking. I can't stop worrying. And it begins to happen. So what happened in the day of uh, when the Israelites were in the wilderness... God said to them, I want you to work six days, and on the seventh day, take a rest, okay? And this is the context of this, all right? So, tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what will be baked, and boil what you will boil, and answer the emails that you're in, <laughs> and all that's left over. Lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning, as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink. That's a good thing when it does not stink, Okay? And there were no worms. What, why is that? Because what happened is they tried to collect and hoard more than they needed. They took more than they needed. When they took more than they needed by not trusting God, it began to stink. Let me tell you something. When you hold on to your time, when you hold on to your possessions, and you don't trust God, well, you know what happens? It begins to rot. It begins to stink. This is what happened. And there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. In other words, God will provide what you need, but today it will not be in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. They didn't trust God, all right? They, on their day of rest, they went out to try to find more. But what's so amazing is what God did when they gathered the manna, they gathered twice the amount on Friday, and the only time it did not dissolve and stink and decompose was on Friday. And it lasts until Saturday, the Sabbath. And they had plenty. God provided double for their day off. 
That's what he did. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. It's a, it's a gift, right? Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. So God will actually give you more. He'll actually multiply your effort. He will bless your effort so you can take a rest. Now, why is that legalism? I don't know about you, but I kind of like that. Don't you not like that? Weren't you going to get paid double time and get paid for it and not have to work? Wouldn't that be nice? Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. This is the deal here. You see, God can do more with your six days than you can do with seven. There's something supernatural about it. It's almost like tithing, where you can live that God will bless. You can do more 90% than you can with 100% if you give 10% to God. God can stretch it, and God will do something miraculous, and God will do the same thing with your time. I can't afford to do it. You know, there's a man by the name of Joseph Lieberman who was a senator in Connecticut for many years, uh, Democrat, then became an independent. He also ran on the presidential ticket with Al Gore when they went, uh, ran against George W. Bush in 2000. And he came out with this book after. It's called The Gift of Rest. Joe Lieberman is a Jewish person. He actually honors the Sabbath. And he talked about how he honored the Sabbath even during the presidential campaign. Now listen, how many of you are as busy as a politician? during running for the president. That's pretty busy. But he took a rest. He called it God's gift. It's a great book. I read it. It's a great book. And he talks about the, the, the richness. I'll be quoting for it later on. The richness that happens in the Jewish culture. So God can do more with your six days than you can with the seven. I don't know if you realize this, but fast food restaurants, um, they didn't, I read a uh, study not too long ago, that uh, the fast food restaurants Usually, they gross a, a fast food restaurant, the average, okay, this is an average, about a million dollars a year per franchise place. Okay, this McDonald's and all the Wendy's and all those guys. Okay, they usually average about a million dollars of grossing. And they're open seven days a week. Some are open 24 hours a day. Yet, there's one individual by the name of Kathy Truth, who is now home with the Lord, began a franchise in 1948 called Chick-fil-A. Now, I'm not... I'm not getting any accolades from this, okay? But if, if anyone's watching from Chick-fil-A and want to give me gift certificates, it's fine. <laughs> but in 1948, he made a decision. It's in their actual policy. You can see it in the restaurant. We want, to give, uh, we want to give our workers a rest so they can worship. So since 1948, they've been doing this. And, and by the way, do you know what the most successful, one of the most successful days in the franchise business of fast food restaurants is happens to be Sunday? A very successful day, right? So think about this. Some are open 24 hours a day, yet Chick-fil-A, guy is, uh, and they, they were founded by a Christian. They had this policy even today. Guess what their annual gross is per franchise average? Okay? All the other ones are, are $1 million a year. $5 million working six days a week. Think about that. So I am so excited about that that I decided to buy everyone a lunch at Chick-fil-A today. It's on me. <laughs> you didn't get it. <laughs> They're closed. <laughs> okay, you guys are sharper than you think. Okay, okay. But God can do, and actually Hobby Lobby, someone told me, Pastor, you didn't mention Hobby Lobby. Okay, Hobby Lobby also, what a great name. They're also closed on Sunday, and they're very prosperous as well. You see, there's something supernatural that God does when you obey His Word and honor His Word. He multiplies it. He multiplies it. And whether you're a Christian or not, you're not designed to go 24-7. You're not designed to work seven days a week. So why was this command given? It's, it was in our created design before the fall. Okay, I hope you understand that. Before the fall, okay? It gives God the opportunity to provide for us supernaturally. How many like to be provided for supernaturally? I remember when I was in seminary, uh, I don't know what was wrong with my Greek professor. My Hebrew professor was nice. He gave us a test on Thursday, which I appreciated because he understood the Sabbath. But my Greek professor, he's still alive, he gave us a test on Monday. So I had a Greek exam on Monday. And Greek didn't come easy to me, right? Especially Hebrew. So I had to study. And so 
my friend, and my friend would not study. On, I said, no, I'm going to honor the Sabbath. And I didn't honor the Sabbath. And I struggled in Greek. And I finally said, you know what? I'm going to listen to, I'm going to do what my friend did. So I, I decided not to study on Sunday and take the day off. And my grades went up in Greek. I went from a C to an A. Less anxiety. So I learned that way back then, right? And I'm telling you something. When you honor God, and you do things his way, it actually works. So it gives God the opportunity to provide for us, and it gives us an opportunity to be rested and refreshed. Now, is that a bad thing? You're being legalistic. Is it a bad thing to be rested and refreshed? Absolutely not, right? You want to be that way? Look what the Word of God says in Deuteronomy, which is the second place this is found. You shall remember that you were a slave. In the land of Egypt, for 400 years, over 400 years, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. They had no rest. They were constantly being whipped and, and working all the time. You see, in ancient, in, in antiquity, in those days, only the rich and the wealthy could take a day off. And God gave a whole nation a day off. But when they were a slave, how many of us are a slave? A slave of trying to keep up with what's going on. A slave to your work. You can never get it down. There's always a knot in your stomach. There's always this stress. And, 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 and this is happening because you always have this, this pressure on you, right? So um, you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. I'm telling you, take a rest. No, I can't trust God. i got to make it happen on my own. You know what happens when that happens? God's okay, have it your way. Reminds me of a story of two men cutting wood, and they were getting paid how many cords they would cut. And one guy was frantic. He was trying to cut as much as he could. The other guy would cut his wood, and every, every once in a while, he would go away for about 15 to 20 minutes and come back and cut it again. And the guy that went away for a rest had more wood cut than the other one. And this other guy had more muscles. It's like, what's going on? How can you keep going away and you cut more wood? It's just, I'm sharpening my axe. Many of us are dull because we never give a rest for God to refresh us. It's so important to do that. God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So you are no longer a slave, it says in Galatians 4, 7. So why do we work like we're a slave? Son. And if a son than an heir through God. God doesn't want us to be slaves, everybody, to work so hard. Well, I, I can't afford but to work. Tell that to Joseph Lieberman, right? Tell it to this guy running for president. I'm telling you, it works. And I've been doing my best to do it, and sometimes I break it. I'm using my Sabbath as a, a Sabbath. My day off is usually Monday, where I take a time and I just sleep late, read the Word of God, spend time with my wife, have a nice cup of coffee, and just chill out. But sometimes what happens is... Uh, that thing goes off, and I'm like, I'm feeling peaceful, and I look at it, and immediately, not in my stomach. Oh, why did I have to read that stinking text? So what I got to write on there, it says, please call back tomorrow. I'll call Pastor Rich. So we're learning how to take that Sabbath, because you know what? You need it. Everyone needs it. I'm not suggesting I'm working any harder than you all, but you're designed to work. You're designed to take a rest. And if you don't, you're going to hurt yourself, okay? You're no longer a slave. In Exodus 31, it says, you shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy, set apart for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. What? This is, so are you telling you God's going to kill us? No, but you might kill yourself. Work yourself to a death. Let me explain something here. This is, this, is the, uh, this is the civic law and ceremonial law. This is not moral law. The moral law is to keep the Sabbath. The consequences of the civil law back in those days, no matter tribe, Millions of people in the wilderness, right? They had a law back then. That we, don't, we don't have to adhere to that. But there was a moral law that's beyond civic law and ceremonial law. We talked about that the first week. People often get it confused. But could it be that we're working ourselves to death? Could it be that some of us die prematurely? I was uh, reading a, a book uh, by uh, James Buchan called The Rest of God. And he talks about it. Now, he was visiting a pastor. Wanted to have lunch with his pastor. He said, hey, can we have lunch on Thursday? Sure. I, I, um, well, not Thursday. I can't do it Thursday. Why? I'm, I have nothing, I have, I'm doing nothing on Thursday. Great. Then we'll meet on Thursday. I'm doing nothing on Thursday. I can't meet. 
Okay, we'll meet on Thursday. No, you don't understand. I've planned to do nothing on Thursday. It's my day off. It's my day of rest. When we go out, I'll explain it to you. The man takes him out to lunch, talks to him. Guy was 55 years old when, he, when this happened, and he talked about what happened when he was 41. He says, I was in the hospital. Organs were shutting down. They didn't know what was wrong with me. And they couldn't figure out mysterious stress, whatever it was. He said, what happened was, I just, I just feel like the Lord told me, you're working too much. You need to take a break. You need to honor the Sabbath. And he did that. He says, I had not been back to the hospital since. And I take one day off a week, no work. I just give it to God, and I rest. Listen, it, you can work yourself to death. Like that Japanese woman. And God is sitting there saying, I want you to rest. I want you to be refreshed. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does not, who does work on it, that shall should be cut off from among his people. Six days shall be, work shall be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, a solemn. In other words, give it to God. Not just leisure, not just watching the patriots lose. I'm saying that in faith. I'm just kidding. Not just, not just relaxing, but making it set apart for God. That I'm going to recalibrate my life. I'm going to give God the first part of it. I'm going to do that. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Right? It is a sign forever. So is, this, is the Sabbath just for the Old Testament? No. It's for us today. Remember we said it was in the created order before the law was even given. This is for your benefit. This is for your benefit. It's a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the Sabbath is God's gift to us. In fact, I got this quote from jo Joseph Lieberman's book where he, he quotes um, Ahab Haman who said this, more than the Jews have kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept the Jews. Listen, think about how successful the Jewish people are. Think about the strong strength of their families. They take the Sabbath seriously, and God blesses them, those that do that. What's so interesting is, is this. What's a typical sh sh Shabbat? Shabbat is, let me read to you where a Jewish man actually summarizes what a Shabbat is like. A Shabbat is at sundown. On a Friday, they light their candles. They light two candles. I'll go ahead and read a summary of it, okay? An average Shabbat can be a bit longer, but here's a, here's a gist of it. A Shabbat begins at sunset because of the story of creation, because there was evening and morning on the day. Shabbat and Deuteronomy candles are lit in a blessing recited no later than 18 minutes before sunset. So 18 minutes before sunset, they read a blessing. Two candles are lit to represent the two places of the Sabbath in Scripture, Exodus and Deuteronomy. Okay? The family then observes a brief family service. After the service, the family comes home for a festive, leisurely dinner. By the time this is all completed, maybe 9 o'clock p.m. or later, the family has time to talk, study the Torah, and then go to sleep. The next morning, the Shabbat services begin about 9 a.m., and to go about to noon. Our services are short. Can I hear an amen? Come on. Okay. After the services, the family has another leisurely festive dinner meal. The family uh, talks and studies the Torah, takes a leisurely walk, plays checkers or other leisure act activities, takes a short afternoon nap, is not uncommon. It is tradition to have a third meal before Shabbat is over. Shabbat ends in the evening about 40 minutes after sundown when at least three stars are visible. At the conclusion of Shabbat, a blessing is recited, dividing the division of the sacred and the secular between the Shabbat and the working days. As you can see, the Shabbat is full, a full day when it's observed, and it's very relaxing. You really don't miss driving a car turning on the TV, or devices, or shopping. Can I, I mean, this sounds like a pretty fun thing, right? That sounds like, this sounds like um, Thanksgiving, right? You eat, take a nap, eat some more, take a nap, have some pumpkin pie, take a nap, right? And, and so, 
what a wonderful thing. Now, what, what's wrong with that? Now, do we have to do it that way? No. But how, what would happen to us if you and I would trust God that we're going to trust God with six days of our work and we're going to give him a day to honor him and a day to rest? What happened in the book of Acts, they started meeting on Sunday, the first day of the week, and Sunday became the Sabbath or the early church. In fact, even John the Apostle wrote in the book of Revelation, he says, on the, on the Lord's day, the angel came and gave me the revelation, which was Sunday. So tradition, it began to switch, and the, and the Christian church began, early church had Sabbath and Sunday, but eventually it moved to Sunday, a day of rest. And what happens is when we don't do it, there is stress, there's problems. You see, God has designed us to reset our lives. So how do we keep the Sabbath commandment today? How are we supposed to keep it today? Are we supposed to do all these things? No, we don't have to do all those things, okay? But in Mark 2, 27, 28, the disciples were walking through a field one day, and the Pharisees, they had all these rules. You weren't allowed to walk a certain amount of steps. You could only walk a certain, even in Israel today, they have elevators where you don't have to push the button because on Sunday, you don't have to touch the button. It goes up by itself. They have all these rules. That was never God's intention. It got to the point that it, was, it became slavery to do the Sabbath. All right? But Jesus, one day his disciples were going through a grain field and they rubbed the, the heads together and they had some kernels. And the Pharisees, they're working on the Sabbath. You're hitting on the Sabbath. And this is what Jesus did. He puts it in the right perspective which was always from the beginning, okay? And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You see that? The Sabbath is a gift. God gave us the Sabbath not for us to work for the Sabbath, but it's a gift for us, okay? Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even on the Sabbath. So Jesus observed the Sabbath. Yes, he did. He took a day of rest. He went to the so he went to the synagogue. He went to the temple. The early church honored the Sabbath. They moved it to Sunday. Sabbath means Saturday, but they moved it to Sunday the first day of the week. They had a day where they ceased from their work, and God honored it. Okay? How do we do it? Well, make a decision to trust God and step out in faith and observe, the, and observe a day off. Find a day. I, 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 I double-dog dare you to give it a shot. Just say, you know what, but I can't. Listen, Jesus did it. The early apostles did it. Joseph, the leader, not even a believer, but a Jewish man, he does it and it works. Listen, guys, it works. Do double the work and take it off. Maybe have an email saying, I will answer emails to follow tomorrow. Right? If, you have, if you're a doctor and you're on call, I understand. I'm sorry, the patient's going to have to die. No, don't do that, okay? They're, they're upset. I mean, when, when, a, when a mule falls into a well, of course you get it out, Jesus even said. Don't get legalistic about it. But make an opportunity to take a day off, to rest, to cease from your work. Sunday's a good day for it. Come to church, go out, get something to eat, relax, take a nap, right? Enjoy each other, spend time thinking about the week, kind of resettle yourself. Make a decision to trust God, step out on faith. I guarantee you, you'll be blessed. It works, everybody. You're going to find something when you do this, which I'll share in a few minutes. And then focus on God, not just leisure activities. Now, I know today I'm not here going after anybody, but we have a lot of activities scheduled on Sunday that take the place of focusing on God. I want to encourage you to make it a priority to focus on God. Every day, of course, but on Sunday, on a day, find a day where you rest, come to church, have a meal together, take a nap. Can I hear an amen for the nap? Amen. That's the biggest amen I've heard in a long time. Except for the free lunch at Chick-fil-A. Okay. Focus on God. And focus on rest and refreshment. Rest and refreshment. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In Hebrews it says this. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Well, let me explain something to you about this. When you and I will commit ourselves to take a day of rest, what you're doing is you're training your psyche, you're training your body to take a rest, to turn it off, to defrag. 
You know what's happened to me as a result of doing this? It helps me shut off my mind. So the hamsters stop running on their wheel. Think about it. When you do this and you honor God, you learn a discipline to turn it off. Maybe Sunday would be a great day to turn off the devices. Turn off Instagram and Facebook, unless you're going to Instagram their service. That's good. How about we just do that, everybody? Take an opportunity. Take a Sabbath rest. And you're going to develop a discipline that God will bless you. I, 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 I dare you to try this. It's going to work. You're going to find that you're going to get more stuff done. You're going to sharpen your axe, and God is going to go to work for you. And you're going to start learning how to turn off and de-stress your life. How many of you could de-stress your life a little bit? Let's trust God. God can handle the universe. You're not Charles Atlas. You don't have to carry the world. The work is still going to be there. Trust God and watch what God will do. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience as the Israelites did. There's a rest for those in God. Are you at rest in your soul? You see, a resting death by God's rest. How many of you want to have a rest death and have life in your life? Let's do that. Let's give God at least one day a week where it's focused for him. Every day is the Lord's day. I understand that. Every day is a Sabbath rest. I understand that. But this is beyond Old Testament law. This is the created order that you and I have been designed in. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for today. I want to thank you for your Ten Commandments. There are ten ways for us to live a life of ten. Lord, forgive us for not trusting you like we know better than you do. You're the great designer. You're the one that made us. You're the one that loves us. And you've made us to rest. And you've also made us in your image to be in communion with you. Father, I pray right now we would have the courage to step out in faith and believe your word and set aside a day of rest where we no longer do our normal work, but we do things that will refresh us and reinvigorate us. Lord, we don't want to do it out of legalism, but we want to do it out of love and respect to you, knowing that you will take care of our work if we give our work to you in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a question. Have you entered the rest of God?